Number 1. Mary Lucina was last seen in Albuquerque, New Mexico on September 22, 1979. She was last seen with her cousin, Billy Cena, in the area of Edith Road and the 300 block of Mountain Road Northeast in Martinez Town neighborhood at approximately 10 a.m. The pair left to go to the post office to play in the grass and never returned. Neither child has been seen or heard from since that time. While the circumstances of the Cena children's disappearance are unclear, authorities have developed various theories in their disappearances. None of these theories have ever come to a conclusion in the case, however. In 2011, authorities stated they had identified a person of interest in the case. The person of interest is Michael Cordova, whom was the live and boyfriend of Billy's mother at the time. Billy's sister stated that Cordova was a drug dealer and grew marijuana in the backyard of the family home. She remembers that shortly before the children disappeared, one of Cordova's plants disappeared and he blamed Billy for the missing plant. He severely beat the boy. Authorities are trying to find and question Cordova in connection to the disappearance and also stated they are looking for a woman named Liza Ramirez, who lived with the children in their home 1979. Authorities have theorized that the children may have run away of had been abducted and possibly killed. They at one point considered that both children got locked into a rail car while playing. There were rumors that both children had been slain and were buried in the basement of a house in the Martinez town area. None of these possibilities have been confirmed. At the time of her disappearance, Mary Lou was a fourth grader at Longfellow Elementary School and Billy was a sixth grader at Truman Middle School. Most of the children's relatives have passed away, but Billy's sister and Mary Lau's mother are still alive. Their cases remain unsolved and are classified as non-family abductions. If you have any information concerning this case, please contact Albuquerque Police Department 505-242-2677. Number 2. Ara Johnson was a five-year-old girl who lived in Big Sandy, Texas in a mobile home with her parents, James and Ophelia Johnson. Ara had a brother who died in May 1985, age six after he accidentally drowned. No further details are known about his death. Ara was better known as Nisi, spelling as Ify, but it's pronounced Nisi, she was last seen wearing just a pair of orange underpants she wore to bed. At the time, her lower front teeth were missing. On April 2, 1986, James apparently checked up on Ara between 1 and 2 in the morning and found her sleeping soundly in bed. Her parents got up at about 6.30 and found she had gone, and her bed sheet had gone with her. Presumably she had left the trailer with a blanket wrapped around her. The back door was left hanging open. Nothing else was missing from the trailer at all. No neighbors reported hearing or seeing anything suspicious. Police dogs searched the trailer park and found no trace of her. Police assumed she had been taken by someone who knew her family or had at least watched them. The parents were suspects for a while, but no real evidence pointed towards them harming her. David E. Penton is the prime suspect in this case. David is a child rapist and killer who was from Texas, he's been confirmed to have killed four girls aged between three and nine, as well as his son between 1984 to 1988, and is suspected of killing even more. Cops think his kill count is in the 20s. David is a former soldier whose reign of terror began when he killed his two-month-old baby in 1984 by shaking him to death. He fled the cops and became a fugitive, traveling all across America. In 1988, he kidnapped and murdered nine Yonidra Ross and was convicted in 1992 and given a life sentence. In 2005 he was convicted of the murders of three more girls, all of them from Dallas, Texas. David has been questioned about dozens of cases and always denies them. He doesn't name victims like some serial killers do. He claims he is not a monster and didn't just go around killing for the fun of it and that it's just how it turned out and he'd rather he hadn't killed them. He also claims he isn't a pedo and he only targets young girls because he's scared of STDs. Between 2006 and 2007, police reopened the case to see if David could have killed Ara, but found that James was dead and they couldn't reach Ophelia. They couldn't find any leads that could prove or disprove him being involved. Although he is the prime suspect in Ara's case, I don't believe he did it. It doesn't suit his mo, he usually lured girls into his car while they were out and about. He did however once kill his friend's daughter after managing to be alone with her. His crimes were usually opportunistic and a home invasion takes planning. I don't believe Ara wandered off because the timing wouldn't line up. I don't think she could move that far from being asleep at 1 to 2 a.m. to completely vanished at 6 a.m. 
What do you think happened? If you have any information concerning this case, please contact Upshur County Sheriff's Office 903-843-2541. Number 3. Have you ever heard or read about a murder case where the victim is declared both dead and missing at the same time? Of course not. Millions of people die each year, but only a handful of those cases make the news headlines. The case of George Ann Hawkins is a case that has left people wondering and confused. The real story behind this murder or disappearance is still unknown after almost half a century, and it is still listed as missing persons case. Despite the confession from the serial killer Ted Bundy, the disappearance of Hawkins is still a mystery. Ted Bundy was probably the most notorious American serial killer who raped, murdered and kidnapped dozens of young women in the 70s. The serial killings of Ted Bundy rocked the United States and made headlines for months. The disappearance of George Ann Hawkins is probably one of the greatest mysteries in American history. George Ann Hawkins was an 18-year-old young woman from Tacoma, Washington. She went missing between the 10th to 11 June 1974. She disappeared on her way back to her sorority on the morning of 11 June 1974. She was last seen leaving her boyfriend's place and was never seen again, neither dead nor alive. She was last seen wearing a backless white t-shirt and navy blue belt bottom pants. Neither she nor her clothes have been found till date. Hawkins' roommate reported her missing to the house mother around 3 a.m. Police arrived early in the morning because there were similar cases of the disappearance of young women. Despite the immediate response and highlighting of the case, the case was quickly overshadowed by similar cases. After few weeks of Hawkins' disappearance, two other women also disappeared from the Lake Sammamish area. On 14 July 1974, two women disappeared from the area four hours apart. Both women disappeared in broad daylight. First was 23-year-old woman Janice Ann Ott who worked as a probation caseworker. The second was Denise Nasland, a 19-year-old computer programming student. According to nearby people, Janice was approached by a handsome man wearing a white t-shirt and tennis shorts. The picnickers overheard their conversation, where the guy had his arm in a sling and asked Janice for help in putting his sailboat on his car. After their disappearance, several young women aged between 18 to 25 contacted authorities, claiming that they were approached by a guy named Ted with his arm in a sling. One witness claimed that she even walked to his car with him which was a metallic brown Volkswagen bug, but did not get in. In 1989, before his execution, Ted Bundy claimed to have abducted and murdered Hawkins. He claimed to kidnap Hawkins from the alleyway, after tricking her by limping on crutches pretending to be injured. Bundy dropped his briefcase and asked Hawkins to help it put into his car. When Hawkins tried to help him, he hit her with a crowbar and knocked her out. He put her in the car and fled the scene. According to Bundy, Hawkins regained consciousness on the way and garbled about the Spanish test she had in the morning. Poor Hawkins believed that Bundy had taken her to tutor her for the Spanish test. The heartless killer knocked her unconscious again. After reaching the destination, he strangled her to death before decapitating her. Bundy also told authorities that he went back to the crime scene in the morning on his bike where the law enforcement was sealing off the area. He claimed that he recovered Hawkins' earrings that fell off when he hit her with the crowbar. Ted also claimed to have taken her shoe from the same parking lot. Bundy also mentioned that he observed the authorities from a distance in the parking lot. Have you ever heard or read about a murder case where the victim is declared both dead and missing at the same time? Of course not. Millions of people die each year, but only a handful of those cases make the news headlines. The case of George Ann Hawkins is a case that has left people wondering and confused. The real story behind this murder or disappearance is still unknown after almost half a century, and it is still listed as missing persons case. Despite the confession from the serial killer Ted Bundy, the disappearance of Hawkins is still a mystery. Ted Bundy was probably the most notorious American serial killer who raped, murdered and kidnapped dozens of young women in the 70s. The serial killings of Ted Bundy rocked the United States and made headlines for months. The disappearance of George Ann Hawkins is probably one of the greatest mysteries in American history. George Ann Hawkins was an 18-year-old young woman from Tacoma, Washington. She went missing between the 10th to 11 June 1974. She disappeared on her way back to her sorority on the morning of 11 June 1974. She was last seen leaving her boyfriend's place and was never seen again, neither dead nor alive. She was last seen wearing a backless white t-shirt and navy blue belt bottom pants. 
Neither she nor her clothes have been found till date. Hawkins' roommate reported her missing to the house mother around 3 a.m. Police arrived early in the morning because there were similar cases of the disappearance of young women. Despite the immediate response and highlighting of the case, the case was quickly overshadowed by similar cases. After few weeks of Hawkins' disappearance, two other women also disappeared from the Lake Sammamish area. On 14 July 1974, two women disappeared from the area four hours apart. Both women disappeared in broad daylight. First was 23-year-old woman Janice Ann Ott who worked as a probation caseworker. The second was Denise Nasland, a 19-year-old computer programming student. According to nearby people, Janice was approached by a handsome man wearing a white t-shirt and tennis shorts. The picnickers overheard their conversation where the guy had his arm in a sling and asked Janice for help in putting his sailboat on his car. After their disappearance, several young women aged between 18 to 25 contacted authorities, claiming that they were approached by a guy named Ted with his arm in a sling. One witness claimed that she even walked to his car with him which was a metallic brown Volkswagen bug, but did not get in. In 1989, before his execution, Ted Bundy claimed to have abducted and murdered Hawkins. He claimed to kidnap Hawkins from the alleyway after tricking her by limping on crutches pretending to be injured. Bundy dropped his briefcase and asked Hawkins to help it put into his car. When Hawkins tried to help him, he hit her with a crowbar and knocked her out. He put her in the car and fled the scene. According to Bundy, Hawkins regained consciousness on the way and garbled about the Spanish test she had in the morning. Poor Hawkins believed that Bundy had taken her to tutor her for the Spanish test. The heartless killer knocked her unconscious again. After reaching the destination, he strangled her to death before decapitating her. Bundy also told authorities that he went back to the crime scene in the morning on his bike, where the law enforcement was sealing off the area. He claimed that he recovered Hawkins' earrings that fell off when he hit her with the crowbar. Ted also claimed to have taken her shoe from the same parking lot. Bundy also mentioned that he observed the authorities from a distance in the parking lot. Number 4. Resolution in the 30-year odyssey the Honda family of Fairfield has endured came Tuesday during a 20-minute court hearing. Solano County presiding judge John B. Ellis imposed a negotiated 25 years to life prison sentence on Michael Fedgerang in connection with the kidnapping and death in the mid-1980s of three-year-old Clark Tashiro Honda. Fedgerang, 57, pleaded no contest in October to first-degree murder in the 1984 death of the boy who was abducted from his home on Magellan Road, where the Auto Mall Parkway now stands. Fedgerang is required to serve the new 25 years to life consecutively to a 26-year prison term he is now serving after his no-contest plea and 2002 to 4 felony child sexual assault charges. A number of Clark Tashiro Honda's family members spoke during Tuesday's proceedings. They refer to the boy as Tashiro. Earl Honda, the boy's uncle, Rachel Borg, the victim's sister, and Tashiro's father, Ron Honda, recalled a vibrant child, playful and full of life, whose disappearance left the family devastated, not knowing what happened to him, and when, or if, he would be found. Family members also praised the support they have received over the course of three decades from various levels of law enforcement, as well as support from many in the community. Borg read a statement from her mother, who was not able to attend Tuesday's sentencing, noting the monstrous act that went unsolved for 30 years and describing how she holds to the memory of the three years and eight months the family had with Tashiro, before he was taken from them. She said Tashiro will live on through his family. Ron Honda, who is now retired, said it was tough for him to get up Tuesday morning for the court hearing, his wife is the early riser. He spoke of the family's 30 years of pain, and he spoke of forgiveness. The elder Honda expressed gratitude to Fedgerang for coming forward to bring closure to the Honda family. He thanked law enforcement, from local police to the FBI, for their work on the case. He spoke of forgiveness to both Fedgerang and to some in the community 30 years ago who spoke without knowledge, those who offered up speculation about the kidnapping. He then quoted from scripture. His blessings are now every morning, and this is the beginning of life that's been put off, to a certain extent, Ron Honda said. I will be reunited with Toshiro in the not-too-distant future. I'm glad that we're done here and don't have to live with that sword over our heads," he said. Deputy District Attorney Bruce Flynn prosecuted the case. He offered praise for how family members have handled themselves since the case saw a new life in 2016. He also asked that Ellis not forget the horror the family endured for so many years. I am amazed by their character today, Flynn said of the Honda family. 
They don't know where his body is, and they have to live with that. Ellis said he was horrified by what he read in the court file, since taking the case. He said lawyers on both sides of the case did the right thing to work out a negotiated plea and sentence. That agreement includes a provision whereby Fedgerang waives his appellate rights in connection with the case. Flynn and Sergeant Troy Oviatt of the Fairfield Police Department met with the family in the courthouse hallway immediately after Fedgerang was sentenced. The prosecutor answered questions about the possibility of parole for Fedgerang and how the parole board will not only consider the facts in this case, but in Fedgerang's other cases in determining whether to grant a parole hearing and, if one is granted, whether to grant parole. Flynn spoke of Fedgerang's health and that fact that he has already spent a great deal of time incarcerated. Oviatt spoke of the work over the years by a series of detectives. He said the details in the case, though horrible, help them and now help him as he works other cases, a silver lining of sorts that he hoped would help the family reach a sense of closure. He also praised the family for their positive attitude throughout the case. A ransom note was discovered shortly after Tashiro was discovered missing by his mother, Linda Honda, the morning of August 22, 1984, demanding money for the boy's safe return, but the family received no further contact and the child was never returned. The bedroom window was open. A search of the home was fruitless, so Linda Honda called police. Soon an army of police, to include as many as 20 FBI agents, were involved in the search. A kidnapping for ransom seemed unusual. Linda Honda worked as her husband worked at a Benicia oil refinery. More than 150,000 flyers with Tashiro's picture were distributed throughout Northern California. His picture was one of the first to be printed on milk cartons. Then the case went cold. The Fairfield Police Department, along with the FBI, worked for many years and re-examined the case in 2011, the district attorney's office has said. Detectives learned that Fedgerang, who later worked as manager of Odyssey Card, Games and Collectibles in downtown Fairfield, planned the 1984 kidnapping for ransom and killed Toshiro shortly after he was kidnapped. Police have said that Fedgerang in 1984 was a longtime friend of the Honda family. Fedgerang was serving a long prison sentence for the 2001 Fairfield child sexual assault when he was arrested in April 2016 at a state prison in Chichilla in the cold case. One piece of court business remains in the case. A final determination of fines and credits. Ellis met just prior to Tuesday's sentencing hearing with Flynn and defense counsel Sarah Johnson to discuss those issues. Ellis said in court that the passage of so much time since Tashiro was abducted and killed makes it unclear which standards apply when considering the matter of credits for time already served in the case and the appropriate fines. Those issues will be considered at 8.30 a.m. January 29. 2018. Fedgerang will remain in the county jail until then. At the time of his disappearance, Clark lived with his family in a modest house and was the youngest of nine children. His father and mother had three children together and his mother had six from a previous marriage. Clark shared his room with five other people. His parents had separated the month before his disappearance. Clark's abduction remains unsolved. His father and uncle are still know to live in Fairfield. Foul play is suspected. If you have any information concerning this case, please contact Fairfield City Police Department 707-428-7374. Number 5. Alexandria Suleski was last seen in Radcliffe, Kentucky on October 23, 1989. She was last seen at approximately 2 p.m. while she played outside of her family's home at the Duval Mobile Home Park on South Wilson Road which is located near the 1100 block of Dixie Highway. She disappeared at some point afterwards and has never been seen again. Her family reported her missing on October 26 and a huge search was undertaken to try and locate the little girl. Her family originally stated that Alexandria had wandered away. Authorities initially believed that Alexandria had possibly wandered off into one of the various sinkholes in the area. They soon figured that this is not what happened at all. After so much time had passed without finding Alexandria, investigators started to suspect foul play as a possible factor in the case. After a month, authorities said they believed that Alexandria had been abducted by a stranger. This possibility was considered even more likely when sightings of Alexandria were called into authorities in the months after her disappearance. In at least one of these sightings, Alexandria was seen with an unidentified woman, but it's unclear what came of that lead. Various missing children agencies list her as a non-family abduction. 
In April of 1990, Alexandra's father and stepmother, Thomas, and Roxanne Suleski were arrested for child abduction as well as violating a custody order in relation to Alexandria and her sister, Dawn. Thomas was supposed to take Alexandria and Dawn on a vacation in August of 1989, but instead he moved the family to Kentucky. Alexandria and Dawn's biological mother had custody of them. After the move, Alexandria and her older sister lived with Roxanne, Thomas, and Roxanne's older daughter, Nissa Bruno. The 1990 charges were dropped due to lack of evidence and authorities were still uncertain as to what happened to Alexandria at the time. In 1993, Thomas and Roxanne were charged with abusing, abducting, and killing Alexandria. Nissa came forward to the FBI and wanted to speak to them about her stepsister's disappearance. She told them that on October 23, 1989, Roxanne severely punished the child because she soiled herself. Alexandria was known to soil herself, and this was said to enrage Roxanne. Alexandria was previously abused by Roxanne. She once used a belt to beat her and made her stand in the corner with her underwear all night. She also once made the child eat jalapeno peppers. On the day she allegedly disappeared, Roxanne placed Alexandria into a garbage bag and made her stay in it. She checked the bag at one point and put that garbage bag with Alex in in another one because she spiked herself out of fear. Nissa testified that she heard gasping noises come from the bag. Alexandria was kept in the bags all day while her sisters were at school. Roxanne went to check on her the next day and found that she had died. She attempted to revive her and called Thomas and told him that the child had died. Instead of notifying the authorities of her death, Thomas buried her body in a box in the woods of Otter Creek Park in Meade County, Kentucky. Nissa feared what her mother and stepfather would do if she told anyone about what happened to Alex, so she went along with their story that Alex disappeared while playing outside. She told Alexandria's sister Dawn and then her father who called authorities. She wore a tape recording and discussed what happened to her sister with Tom. In the tape, Thomas stated that in 1991 he went back to the site where Alex's body was buried and destroyed her skull. He also stated he scattered Alexandria's remains in another state. Both of the defendants maintained their innocence and said they never hurt Alex. They were convicted of all charges brought against them and sentenced to life imprisonment with a chance of parole in 25 years. Theirs was a possibility that they could have received a death sentence for her murder. In early 2001, the Suleski's defense attorneys attempted to have their sentences pushed aside, but the requests were denied and they remained in prison. In 2018, both of them came up for parole. Nissa pleaded with the parole board not to let her mother out because she feared that Roxanne would come after her and her loved ones if she were let out. Roxanne waived her hearing and agreed to serve the rest of her life sentence. In his hearing, Thomas said he was stupid and weak and didn't actually play a part in his daughter's death. He stated that Roxanne told him that Alex died from a sickness she had and he didn't want anyone in his family to be hurt. He disposed of Alexandria's body in order to protect his wife. Thomas and Roxanne have since divorced. Thomas also claimed that Alexandria had never been put in a garbage bag at all and was asleep in her bed when he left that morning. Thomas was denied the possibility parole until 2028. He stated he hopes to be released and was trying to stop making such tragic decisions. Alexandria has never been located despite her father and stepmother's conviction in relation to her murder. She remains listed as a missing child and her case is classified as a non-family abduction. If you have any information concerning this case, please contact Radcliffe Police Department 502-351-5147. Number 6. Dermot Kelly was last seen in Aglesby, Illinois on January 30, 1972. He left his family's residence between 1.15 and 1.30 p.m. with a .22 caliber rifle and stated he was going to the woods alone the Vermilion River for target practice. He was never seen again afterwards. When Dermot failed to return him by approximately 3 p.m., his parents alerted authorities of his disappearance. A search was commenced by 5 p.m. the same day. The day was very cold in general and at night, the temperature was said, or have dropped below zero degrees. The following afternoon, Dermot's jacket and pair of boots were discovered on the bank of the Vermilion River, where it fed into the Illinois River. In addition to the clothing, bare footprints were also found leading into the river and went about 20 feet in. There were no footprints to indicate the person came out of the river, however. 
The river was partially frozen at the time. Nearby was the imprint of a rifle in the snow. Authorities initially assumed that Dermot had fallen into the river and drowned and sent divers to find Dermot's body. While divers did not find his body, they did find a rifle under the ice with a telescopic sight missing. It's believed to belong to Dermot. His parents don't fully believe the drowning theory and have other theories about what happened to him. They believe he may have run away from home to live a transient type of lifestyle. A few days prior to his disappearance, Dermot said he wanted to leave and make a new life for himself. He didn't have much money on him at the time of his disappearance. He was said to be carrying only a single dollar and some change and left all of his personal belongings behind which included his wallet and identification. In 1973, the Kelly family's doctor's wife came forward and said she thought she saw Dermot in Chicago at one point. While it has not been a confirmed sighting, it led his parents to believe the runaway theory. It's been stated that it would be odd for a person to die in the Vermilion River as a body would have surely been found. At the time of his disappearance, his family described him as a non-troublesome boy who did not do drugs or alcohol in 1972. He was a junior student at St. Bede's Academy at the time and was described as an intelligent young man. He was getting B averages at the time and was said to be capable of getting better grades. He did miss weeks of school while being medically treated in Chicago in the fall of 1971. He loved reading and was described as quiet and his father stated that Dermot was troubled by what he described as inequities hypocrisy in society. He shared a nice middle-class home with his parents and four siblings in 1972. Despite extensive searches done by authorities, Dermot has never been located and has since been legally declared deceased in 1992, 20 years after his disappearance. Both of his parents have since died. His case remains unsolved. If you have any information concerning this case, please contact LaSalle County Sheriff's Office 815-433-2161.